Good morning. Thank you, Tara and Rachel and worship team for bringing us to the time of worship. My name is Tom Bird. I had the privilege of serving as an elder at Faith. Our scripture text this morning is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, starting at verse 12. You can find that in the Pew Bibles on page 847. If you do not have a Bible at home, please accept that Pew Bible as our gift and take it home with you today and spend time in God's Word. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, starting at verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. And truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now, whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you who trespasses. So is the reading of God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we come together as a family this morning to come and praise your name and to bring worship to you. Father, we thank you for giving us the freedom to do that. We thank you for the sanctuary. We thank you for the opportunity just to be together. Father, we recognize you as the God Almighty, the God Jehovah, the Creator, the Sustainer, and our salvation. Father, we thank you that we can come together and just be blessed as a family. Father, we thank you today for our staff and for our pastors. We thank you for the opportunity to be back together as a family in September as the church season starts. We thank you for the efforts that the staff puts together just to care for us. And they do care for us, Father, just as you do. Father, we thank you for the blessings you provide. There are prayers and petitions in our hearts this morning, Father. Some will be spoken, some will not. But, Father, you know each and every one. Father, we ask you to consider our prayers and our petitions as we come before you. Father, we are thankful for all that you do for us. We thank you for each and every day. We thank you for the blessings that are poured out upon us. Father, as we come to the proclamation of the word, Father, we pray that the words will just be yours that Pastor Kimber speaks. Grant him a true heart and a peaceful mind this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have taken song, the guitar, Rachel, Tyler, the worship team. Good morning, church. Good morning. Last week, we introduced our new, but not so new, yet it is new, um, vision statement for the year, which is Be the Church in the Community. Our focus is on the church, corporately, collectively, together. Over the course of this next year, we are working to reach people in our community. Over the past year, we've uh, made many efforts to reach people for Christ on a one-to-one -one basis, and that should continue. Our primary method of reaching the lost for Christ is on a one-to-one -one basis. Your friends, your family members, your work colleagues, when you're in, in, in the supermarket, one reaching one, disciples making disciples. But we're making a concerted effort to together reach the lost for Christ. And in conjunction with 
the city mission, our focus for the entire year is all outreach through the city mission, with the city mission, uh, things here in Rexford, things in Glenville, things in Schenectady, hand in hand with the city mission, who have been doing an amazing work for many, many years down in Schenectady. We're excited to launch this tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. here at the Sanctuary. Mike's joining us. Uh, the Bridges for Churches training is something he's bringing. It's 7 until 8.30. So please be here if you can be. Uh, it's, it's an essential part of understanding what we're about to step into, to hear from Mike and to hear about what the, uh, the City Mission has been doing for many years and how we can most effectively partner with them. So join us tomorrow evening, if at all possible, at 7 p.m. as we continue to be the church or begin to be the church collective in the community. Um, our mission trip is coming up soon, the 8th of October. Here's a brief video, and your attention to the screen for a moment. It's from Jeff that we'll be working with, and it shows you some of the uh, area that we will be working in. Hi guys, Jeff here from Atlanta, Georgia, and specifically we're in the neighborhood of Brandon Hill today. Brandon Hill is a neighborhood that we've been working with for several years now. This neighborhood has been neglected, and there's a lot of refugees living here, and some other just really good people that have come from some really difficult circumstances. A lot of people refuse to work here, but this is where we decided to start. And so one of the things we're doing is a weekly Bible study, as well as uh, every month we come and do service projects here so we can get to know the community and be an expression of the love of Jesus to them. So we're really excited to be here. We're excited for our study today. But I just want to tell you, thank you so much for all you do for us. It's like you're literally here locking arms with us because we couldn't be here. And we know that you're praying for us. And thank you so much for your finances. We are a team. So this work could not take place without you. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate and bless you guys. Have a great day. Last week there are 13 of us who, on the 8th of October, are heading down to Atlanta to work with Jeff. And it's not just 13 of us who are on this trip. We all are as a church family. We're on this trip together. And I've asked you already to pray for the team, to pray for those that we will meet as we engage with them. Here are a couple more uh, sp specific ways you can be involved with us as we prepare to leave. We're, we're leaving from the Guardia Airport on uh, Sunday, the 8th of October. We'll be here 8, 8.30 in the morning. You can join us to pray. And then, then we're going to LaGuardia. And we're looking for six people to take us, three to take us down to LaGuardia, three cars, and then three to pick us up on Saturday the 14th to bring us back again. Um, it's incredibly expensive to park a car down at the airport or to hire transport. So if you're available and willing to drive down to LaGuardia, um, I know it's always fun. Everybody loves to drive to LaGuardia. Um, God will be with you and he will protect you. And uh, if you're willing to do that, then please uh, speak to me and let me know. Uh, also, we asked Jeff what, how we could support him financially. What could we raise money for? The teams that he brings in once a month, you saw some of them on the screen and his photo of uh, one of the teams. When they get there, he doesn't have enough tools for all of them to actually be engaged. So he's asking that we might uh, raise finances to provide more tools. He's got three sets of tools, and he needs two more. We're trying to get to five. So how much does a set of tools cost? About $1,000. So a couple of thousand dollars, I think we can do it. And uh, we can bless him with the ability to go and purchase all of that. And then um, we can join that team when we're there and serve the practice way. Every month they have teams like this, local people and mission teams who come in to help in that area. So two tangible ways you can be involved. If you want to give financially, you can write a check in the memo, put commission tools. If you want to put cash in an envelope, commission tools, leave it in the box. Um, there, are, there are ways to give towards that and it will go directly, 100% of it, to Jeff and to those who are working in that area. So thank you for being part of what we are doing as we go into Atlanta and as we go into the community. We are back to Mark. It's been a long time since we were in Mark. It was back in May and we've had our summer series and now we're back to Mark. So I think it's only right that we begin with a, a recap of what we've seen already in the Gospel of Mark. On all of the banners and the graphics you'll see the, the main point of Mark's Gospel is, is written. The good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, that is Mark chapter 1, verse 1. That's how Mark begins. That Jesus is the Son of God. He's no ordinary man. He's God in flesh. And everything that he writes after that, all of the stories that we've seen, are written to substantiate that claim, to prove that claim. 
that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, the religious leaders didn't get it. The crowd that followed him didn't fully understand it. The disciples did not. Even Jesus' own family members did not. And, and we've seen as we've gone through Jesus proving himself to be no ordinary man in freeing people from demonic possession, forgiving sins. That was a big one, wasn't it? When you God can forgive sins, you're a blasphemer. No, that's the point, actually. Jesus is God. And he has the power to forgive sins. Calming the storms, raising a dead girl back to life, feeding maybe 20,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. How many of these stories do you remember? Walking on water. Uh, all things no ordinary man can do. Jesus talking about the heart. Not as the thing that pumps blood around our bodies, but as the thing which identifies us, defines us as a person. Out of the heart comes who we are. Feeding 4,000, seven loaves and uh, a few small fish. Delivering spiritual lessons when the disciples fail to bring practical preparations. They go out the boat, they don't take bread. Jesus uses that opportunity to deliver spiritual lessons. Healing a blind man and the only two-stage miracle we have in the Gospel. Uh, we've seen Peter at last confess, Jesus, you are Christ, the Messiah. Uh, Jesus predicted his death many times, explained it clearly to the disciples that he would die and rise again. A message that those who followed him should not be ashamed of. We looked at the transfiguration, the healing of the boy with the evil spirit, the disciples arguing among themselves, who's the greatest? Jesus brings a child to talk about the seriousness of causing a little one like this to fall. Now, with reference to the young faith that the disciples had. We considered divorce and marriage and gender and sexuality. We've seen uh, Jesus use children as, as an example of, of beautiful faith, childlike faith that we should all have. The rich young man whose wealth got in the way of this relationship with God. James and John, who have the audacious request to be seated on the right and the left of Jesus in heaven, blind Bartimaeus, and the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There's been a lot. Mark's Gospel contains a lot about Jesus. And as we come to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, in verse 12, we're following the triumphal entry, that time when Jesus rode in on those donkeys as the palm branches were laid down, and people cried, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! After that happens, that evening, he goes out and back to Bethany where he was staying, and then he comes in to Jerusalem again. Before we look at these verses, let me tell you the key point of this sermon uh, right at the beginning, because this story is an unusual story. There are lots of opinions about what this actually means, why Jesus does what he does. Let me set out what I think the, the point of this passage of Scripture is. The true fruitfulness, or, or I could say the fruit of a true Christian, is found in faith and in forgiveness. The fruit of a true Christian is found in strong faith and in genuine forgiveness. So let's look at the story and hopefully you'll see that as we work our way through so the next morning, the day after the triumphal entry, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples. And we're told in verse 12 that Jesus is hungry. A reminder of the humanity of Jesus. What is your Jesus like? When you think about Jesus, what is Jesus like? Some of us have an impression of Jesus as God at the expense of his humanity. And some of us have an impression of Jesus as man at the expense of his deity. But Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He is the God-man. And at times in the scriptures we are reminded of his deity. And at times we are reminded of his humanity. And here we're reminded of his, his humanity. He's hungry. He's a, a, a human being. He's, he's hungry. And in the distance he sees a fig tree. Now a fig tree looks something like this. In fact, exactly like this. This is a fig tree. And as Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, this is what he would have seen. Mark tells us that the tree is in leaf. And Jesus makes his way to the tree to see if there is any fruit on the tree. And there wasn't. But Mark tells us that's because it wasn't the season for figs. So that's not terribly surprising. But what is more surprising is what Jesus says to the tree. He says, May no one ever eat from you again. May no one ever eat from you again. <laughs> what did the tree do to him? <laughs> like, what, what, why does he say this to the tree? Like, what? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. And many have been perplexed by what Jesus says. And, and you know how Jesus can curse an innocent tree, particularly since it wasn't the season for figs. Bertrand Russell 
has an essay which has become famous at school, Why I Am Not a Christian. And he cites this passage as one of the reasons for his unbelief, saying, Buddha and Socrates I would place above Jesus due to his display of what Russell calls vindictive fury. So he sees this, that Jesus is vindictive, that his fury is uncalled for. And for that reason, he would rather turn to Buddha or to Socrates. Vindictive fury, but is that what it is? Is that what we have here in this story? It's true that it wasn't the season for figs, but those who know a lot more about plants than me explain that before there are mature figs, in fig season, there are unripe figs known as, in Hebrew, pagim, P-A-G-G-I-M, which are edible and they come at the same time as the leaf. And those who were traveling knew that, and they used to go to fig trees at the time when the tree was in leaf to get not the fig, but the pagim. That's what they would eat. Even still, why was Jesus so harsh towards this tree? How should we understand what he's saying? He used this opportunity to enact a parable. Parable is usually a story that Jesus tells. Here, he enacts a parable. How should we understand this? The fig tree was commonly used as a symbol in the Old Testament for Israel. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10. Micah chapter 7 and verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 17. And this fig tree was fruitless. And Jesus used this fig tree as an example of the fruitlessness of Israel. The fruitlessness of Israel. So park that story for one moment because Mark intentionally brings us to the tree and then to the temple and then back to the tree again. So we have the tree, the fruitless tree. Then in true market style we move quickly to the temple. And like the fig tree, the temple was in leaf. From a distance it looked good. It looked like it was thriving, like it was alive. It looked impressive. There were other people, lots of activity. But when Jesus gets closer and looks closer, there's no fruit. There's no fruit. Instead, he finds a place of worship, the temple area, has been turned into a place of business. And it was unfair business, practiced by money changers who were renowned for their unfair business practices. And so as Jesus comes closer to the temple and the temple grounds and sees what's happening there, what does he do? He, he literally takes the tables of the money changers and those who sell, in, in my Bible the NIV it says doves, in the ESV it says pigeons, and he literally takes their tables and he, he turns their tables over. He turns their tables over. And he drives out those who are buying and selling and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And then he explains his actions by quoting two Old Testament verses, Isaiah 56, verse 7, and Jeremiah 7, 11. This is what it says in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of all. They were misusing this consecrated place, this place that had been set aside for the worship of God. Remember, Jesus hasn't died yet, so the old covenant is still in place. When Jesus dies and rises again, the new covenant comes into action. For right now, the old covenant is in place, and, and the presence of God is found in the temple. You remember the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies? We're told that it was cube-shaped, the same distance deep as it is wide, as it is high, and in there you can find the Ark of the Covenant, and the presence of God would be found. Nobody could go into the Holy of Holies, well one person could, the high priest, but only once a year, and only after he had been atoned for. And that's the structure that existed at this time, that the worship of God would happen at, at this place, at the, at the temple, at the house of God. But that's not the case anymore, allow me uh, a couple of minutes to jump on to one of my hobby horses and to say to you this morning that, that, that this building should not be called the house of God. It's not. This is not the house of God. And, and if you want proof of that, just come here tomorrow morning, about 8 o'clock or so, and um, it's dark, it's quiet. Uh, God's not here. Well, he, if you're saved, He will be, because you'll bring Him with you. But, but He doesn't live here. It's not where He hangs out from 
Monday to Saturday waiting for us to come again on Sunday morning. That's just, that's just not how it is. The amazing thing is that when Jesus died, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was, was torn in two from top to bottom. And access to God was made possible not by visiting a place, but, but through a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. That we can have communion with God now, not by going to the temple, but by repentance and faith in Jesus and, and a relationship with the Father. That actually, this is radical. This, this is a seismic shift that the Jews had to deal with. From God being found in a place to God being found in us. It's radical. That's remarkable. And that's what we have right now, God in us, which the Bible tells us is the hope of glory. But at this moment in time, it was the house of the Lord. And this place was being mistreated. And instead of worship, there's trading. Disingenuous trading. And the fruitless tree that Jesus saw speaks of a fruitless Israel proven by the fruitless temple. And Jesus could not tolerate what was happening there and he displays a righteous anger as he turns the tables. You know, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Uh, it's not the kind of anger that I display when I'm driving my car, Kimber's Confessions. That's not what we're talking about. Sometimes I get a little angry. Other drivers because I am the best driver in the world. And it's always the other people on the road that, that cause the problems. Are you with me? Uh, when I'm doing DIY, I'm, I'm, I'm just not the nicest person in the world. Um, I'm not talking about that kind of anger. I'm talking about a unique anger, a righteous anger. An anger that is displayed and appropriate in response to the reality of injustice or a profound moral lapse. And Jesus displays righteous anger. As he comes in and turns the tables of the money changers and those who are selling doves or pigeons. And in response to what Jesus does, the chief priests and the scribes, they begin to plot a way to kill him. They hate Jesus. They hate what he just did. It's not the first time we've read about that. Chapter 3, verse 6, for the first time they, 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 they decide they hate Jesus and they're going to plot to find a way to have him killed. Now they're really determined. And actually, just a, just a few more days, they will succeed. Three or four more days. And Jesus will be crucified. They hate what he just did. And they want to have him killed. The crowd on the way, when Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem, were, were ready to crown him. And, and just the day, these religious leaders were ready to kill him. Things changed so quickly. So you have the, the initial tree scene, and then you have the temple scene. And now we, we park that, and Mark takes us back to the tree scene, but it's the next day, it's the next morning as they're walking past. And the tree looks very different, this is how it looks now. It's the same tree, but it looks very different. And as they're walking along, Peter, of course it would be Peter, it's always Peter. Okay? Peter notices, he remembers what Jesus said yesterday, and he notices it, and he says, fig tree that you cursed is withered. It's, it's withered to the roots. It's dead to the roots. And Mark has intentionally structured this section of his letter in this way. The, the, the tree that should have been uh, in figs according to Jesus and then the tree that's withered and the, the temple in the middle. And, and, and this scene is sandwiched because the cursing of the tree the cursing of the temple and ultimately, the destruction of the tree speaks of the coming destruction of the temple. The temple one day, very soon, would be destroyed. There would be no need for the temple anymore. It would no longer be a place that people needed to come to to have a relationship with God. It would be no longer a place that people needed to come to to experience the presence of God because God would soon dwell in them. So there's a fruitlessness in the tree, there's a fruitlessness in the temple. Ultimately, the tree is destroyed, and ultimately, the temple would be destroyed. You don't need to, to go to a temple to find the presence of God any longer. That doesn't mean you shouldn't come to church. Completely different thing. You should come to church. But we have in this story a fruitless tree in Israel proven by a fruitless temple. 
Jesus does not intend to cleanse the temple, by the way. I'm looking at your Bible, so what's the heading of that section in your Bible? Does it say the cleansing of the temple? Or the clearing of the temple? It's a little bit misleading. Jesus doesn't intend to cleanse the temple or to clear the temple. He intends to destroy the temple, to actually finish with the temple, to fulfill all that the temple stood for. All the way down to its roots, just like he did that tree. Because Jesus himself was the true temple. And under the new covenant which came about in his blood, there would no longer be the need for the temple, but, but rather Jesus. He would be the one through whom we would come and do come to God the Father. Remember that the Bible says, that Jesus said, I will destroy the temple and three days later it will rise again. And people are like, you're crazy. How can you possibly do that? How can you possibly rebuild the temple in three days? What was Jesus talking about? Himself. It would no longer be a building. It would be his body. He is the, the means of access to God. And when the Spirit was given, God dwelt in us, which is remarkable. And Mark has so much to say about fruitlessness in these verses. And then he turns to remind us of fruitfulness and what true fruitfulness really looks like. He says, true fruitfulness, however, is displayed in faith and in forgiveness. Jesus says, verse 22, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, we'll throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. The Bible talks about believing prayer. And the Bible says very clearly that if we believe for the things that we pray, God will give them to us. The caveat, of course, is always in the will of God. But I, I, I wonder this morning, have any of you ever gone to the mountains and stood at the base of the mountain and, and, and just dared to pray? That mountain would hurl itself into the heart of the sea. I, I, you haven't. And if you did, could you really pray that prayer, believing that it would happen? We're talking about something that's, that's wonderful and unique and powerful. Prayer, believing prayer, that's real prayer. Prayer, when you utter those words, you actually believe when you say that, that God can do it. It's hard to pray that kind of prayer. But the Bible tells me that it's real. And that it's powerful. And so I challenge you. To start praying in a new and unique way as of today for, for things that ordinarily seem impossible because I know this for sure, God can do it. Whatever it is that you think God can't do, He can. But you've been praying for it for so long and it's just, it just seems impossible. It seems impossible but it's not. Not to God. Because with God all things are possible and the Bible tells us that the true faith, the real faith, that faith that is evidence of fruitful lives as Christians can actually ultimately move mountains into the heart of the sea. God sees your faith and it's the fruit of your faith. Yeah, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, goodness, 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 all those things. But also in, 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 in faith, real faith, He sees it. And when, when prayer comes from a heart that's full of real faith, He answers that prayer and He makes it happen. But sometimes you doubt. You don't really believe. We need to pray believing prayer. Because true faith can accomplish more than you can ask or even imagine. I'm going to say this this morning. Our faith should not be in our fruitless country or in its fruitless practices. But our faith should be in God. And God alone. My faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Calvary, Saviour divine, now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away, but let me from this day be holy divine. We should pray in faith that as we draw to the close, Mark records Jesus saying that actually in verse 25 when you stand praying 
If you want anything against anyone, forgive them. So that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Did you see that? Let me read that again. You need to pay attention to this. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him or her. So that your Father in heaven may, that's, that's a really important word, may forgive you your sins. It sounds like faith's condition. Well, it is. The Bible says that you cannot claim to be forgiven if you're not willing to forgive. The Bible says that it's, it's, it's a contradiction to, to claim that God has forgiven you from all the wrong that you have done. And yet you're unwilling to forgive the wrong that people have done against you. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. To, to say, I've repented of my sin. I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven and I'm ready for heaven. And, and then there's no forgiveness in your life. The Bible is clear that if you're not willing to forgive, no matter how hard it is, then you're not forgiven. And we need to pay close attention to those words. There is an extreme warning that if you're not willing to forgive, then then you can't claim forgiveness. Look what verse 26 says. I could leave you for a while to try and find verse 26. But it's not there. Because it's a repeat of verse 25. And some versions have decided to leave that verse out. Others, the King James Version, for example, have left it in. A lot of the Greek texts do not have that verse in them. Some of the old scripts do, some of them. But in any case, it's just a repeat. This is what verse 26 would say if it was there. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is heaven forgive your sin. So some people are just taking that as a duplication. Maybe Mark wanted to emphasize the point, so he wrote it twice. I'm not sure. But the case is made with or without this verse. The point is clear. Forgiveness is only yours if you're willing to forgive. You know, the ultimate example of forgiveness can be found where? I tell you where. Just in a few days' time, three or four days' time, when Jesus would be hanging on a cross, after he had his beard plucked from his face and his back was able to plow the field, after the spear was... Uh, before the spirit pushed pushed aside, but after he'd had the crown of thorns, uh, he'd been spat upon, he had been whipped, he'd been ridiculed, he'd been, he'd been mocked, and he's, he's hanging on the cross, and the people who are uh, executing him are stood before him. What does he say to them? His father. Forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. Now, that's the standard when it comes to forgiveness. Jesus set that example as he was hanging on the cross. You see, the fruitfulness, or should I say, the fruit of a true Christian is found in strong faith and in genuine forgiveness. Those who are not willing to forgive are, are like the tree that's in leaf. You know, it looks good. So those passing by, they seem to be the real deal. They look like Christians. They go to church. They say the right things. But a closer examination will reveal no fruit. I pray that's not you this morning. I pray that there is genuine fruit in your life in the form of real faith and forgiveness, willing forgiveness. Because faith and forgiveness go they go hand in hand. You claim to have one without the other. You claim to have faith without demonstrating forgiveness. I pray that all of us have fruit, that we are not like the, the tree or the, the temple that we read of here, but actually we do have fruit in our lives. Yeah, we have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, self control. But real, genuine faith and a willingness to forgive, because that's what marks you as a Christian. That's what identifies you as a true believer. And my prayer is that every one of you would have fruitfulness in your lives. And not fruitlessness. So let's strive for it. Let's work hard. Well, I pray that you'll help us as we live our lives to live lives of fruitfulness for you and for your glory. That you will help us to pursue things which mark us as true believers. To first of all have strong, immovable faith. And a willingness to forgive. And then to demonstrate all of those qualities that we read of in Galatians 5, 
concerning the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives, that we may be those who are fruitful and not fruitless. Father, I thank you that, that everything changed at this moment when, when Jesus died, that there was no need anymore for a priest, a high priest. There was no need for a temple anymore. There was direct access to you, which we're enjoying right now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Thank you that the things were changed and made new when Jesus died and rose again. I pray, Father, that you will help us to enjoy the awesome privilege of being in communion with you directly through Jesus. It's called prayer. Help us not to neglect prayer. As a sign of our fruitfulness, help us to love to pray. Pray believing in prayer. Pray prayers of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So that we might grow to be like you. And one day we'll see you face to face. But until that time comes, help us be with us. Give us the strength we need. I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand as we close this morning.